Hi there, Riverside Scholars. It's Mrs. Meyer, and I'm back with another chapter of From Pi by Sarah Weeks. And a shout out um, at the beginning of this chapter to Abigail Hankey, who said she's really enjoying the book. And hooray, somebody is listening to the chapters. A story, a story. Let it come, let it go. Chapter three starts out with a recipe for buttermilk pie. Chapter three. There were a couple of surprising things about Polly Portman's will. The first was that she left the pie shop and all of its contents to Reverend Flowers with the instructions that he was to use it in whatever way he chose to help raise funds for the church. Alice's mother was fit to be tied. She's thumbing her nose at us even from the grave, she shouted angrily. We're family. By all rights, the pie shop should be ours. Her dark mood quickly lifted, however, when Polly's lawyer, Mr. Ogden, called the house. He's asked to speak with you, Alice, Alice's father said, handing her the phone. Mrs. Anderson could barely contain herself, breathing down Alice's neck and whispering instructions into her free ear as she strained to hear what Mr. Ogden was saying on the other end of the line. By the time Alice hung up, her mother was practically beside herself. What did he say? she cried. Is it good news? Tell us everything. He wants me to come down to his office, Alice said. And, her mother urged, eyes gleaming. He said, Aunt Polly left me something in her will and that I should come as soon as possible to get it. Did you hear that, George? Alice's mother said excitedly. I'll just run upstairs and put on some lipstick. He wants me to come alone, Mom, Alice said. Oh, said Alice's mother. Did he say anything else? Her father asked, and Alice could tell by the little pink spots on his cheek that he was starting to get excited now, too. Well, it was kind of hard to hear, because Mom was talking at me, to me at the same time, but I know it has something to do with Aunt Polly's pie crust recipe. Great merciful heavens, Alice's mother exclaimed, clapping both hands to her cheeks. Do you realize what this means? Polly has finally set things right. She's left you the recipe. We'll sell it to the highest bidder and kiss all our cares goodbye. Tears of joy filled her eyes as she threw back her head and shouted, We're going to be rich! Alice's father just kept shaking his head and saying, Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. For many years, Alice's father had worked for the Hoover Company, peddling vacuum cleaners door to door. It was not the job of his dreams, so when Pie, the restaurant, began to attract tours to Ipswich, he heard the sound of opportunity knocking. With Polly's blessings, he set up a souvenir stand next to the shop where he sold keychains shaped like rolling pins, leopard print potholders, and aprons with a picture of Polly's smiling face embroidered on the front and the slogan, Hey Polly, what's your secret? stitched beneath it. It was the question everybody asked and answered. Nobody knew. The secret to Polly Portman's perfectly pie, perfect pie crust. It's by far the flakiest. Ever so crisp. Light as a feather. Anyone who doubted this high praise had only to look under Polly's bed. That's where she kept her blueberry medals. Aunt Polly, how come you keep your medals under the bed? Alice asked one day. I keep them under the bed so I won't have to look at them, Polly said. Why don't you want to look at them? Uh, Alice asked. I'm afraid I might get a swelled head, she said with a wink, and then I wouldn't be able to wear my favorite hat anymore. Polly's favorite hat was a leopard print cloche she purchased from the Sears catalog the year she won her first Blueberry Award. The Blueberry Award was established in 1922 to celebrate the most distinguished contribution to American pie making. Each year during the month of August, people all over the country would box up their pies and deliver them to the Blueberry Committee for consideration. The committee members would carefully evaluate the pies. Blueberry buzz would spread to the top contenders emerged. Mock Blueberry Clubs would choose their own favorites and finally on the first Monday in September, Amid a great deal of fanfare, the Blueberry Committee would announce the winner. Polly had never considered entering the contest. She baked because it made her happy, and as far as she was concerned, that was reward enough. 
Then early, one August morning, a woman from St. Petersburg, Florida, by the name of Harriet Melcher, arrived in Ipswich carrying a five-pound coconut in her purse. Later that same day, she boarded the train back to St. Petersburg, holding a cardboard box containing half a coconut cream pie. <laughs> She'd eaten the other half earlier in the day, and her hands were still shaking with excitement. Polly would never have entered one of her pies in the contest herself, but Harriet Melcher happened to be on the Blueberry Committee that year, and after tasting Polly's coconut cream pie, she took the liberty of bringing it, or what was left of it, to the committee herself. This is how it came to pass that at six o'clock in the morning on Monday, September 7, 1942, Polly Portman received a phone call and phone call. The excited voice on the other end of the line belonged to Harriet Melcher. Good morning, Miss Porcher. On behalf of the committee, I am pleased to inform you that you have just been awarded the 1942 Blueberry Medal for your outstanding coconut cream pie. We look forward to seeing you at the award ceremony. Polly was delighted that the committee had enjoyed her pie, but the idea of winning a prize for something made her feel very uncomfortable, so much so that she tried to turn it down. The blueberry is the most coveted award in the field of pie baking, Miss Portman. You have no idea how many people would kill to be in your shoes, Harriet Melcher told her. Oh, what an awful thought, Polly exclaimed. The ceremony is in Philadelphia this year, just a hop, skip, and a jump away from you. Everyone will be so disappointed if you don't come. Not wanting to seem ungrateful, Polly finally agreed to accept the award and attend the ceremony in Philadelphia. She even ordered herself a new hat from Sears. A few weeks later, she wore the leopard print hat to the American Pie Makers Association Conference, where she delivered a heartfelt four-word acceptance speech. Thank you very much. Things changed after Polly Portman won the Blueberry Award. All kinds of people started showing up at the shop with ideas about how she could expand pie or turn it into a national chain. One eager businessman came all the way from Hong Kong to unveil his plans to build a giant factory where Polly's pies would be mass-produced, frozen, and shipped all over the world. He told Polly she would be so rich she'd never have to bake again. Why on earth would I want that? She laughed. Then she handed him a green tomato pie she'd noticed he'd eyed earlier and showed him to the door. Just as the hoopla surrounding Polly's Blueberry Award began to die down, she won another one, this time for her buttermilk pie. Once again, she hadn't entered the contest herself, but the word was out about Polly's pie-making skills, and after that, there was no stopping her. Each sept September, like clockwork, the call would come, and Polly would put on her leopard print hat and go off to wherever the APA conference was being held that year, to deliver the same heartfelt four-word speech. Thank you very much. Polly Portman won 13 blueberry medals in a row, something no pie maker before or since had ever done. Although she may not have wanted to cash in her f on her fame, Polly was more than happy to share her good fortune with her neighbors. With so many out-of-towners coming to Ipswich to visit the pie shop, the other local establishments began to experience a boon in their own businesses as well. The Ipsy Inn, which had been boarded up for years, was suddenly overflowing with guests. The coffee shop, the diner, the drugstore, raked in profits in everything from BLTs to aspirin tablets, and the city council voted to replace the old entering Ipswich sign at the city limit with a fancy new one that said, Welcome to Ipswich, the proud home of pie. In the upper right-hand corner of the sign was a red circle with a number painted in the middle, which changed every time Polly Portman won another Blueberry Award. In 1955, the sign proudly proclaimed 13 blueberries and counting. Busloads of people arrived in Ipswich every day to visit the pie shop, and time and again, Polly was asked to reveal the secret of her perfect pie crust. At least give us a hint, they would beg. Even though Polly Portman was the kind of person who would, would have given you the shirt off her back, she wouldn't tell anyone the recipe for her pie crust. Modesty would have prevented her from saying it, but she knew that the success of the town rested on her shoulders. 
Keeping the recipe a secret was part of what drew the tourists to Ipswich, and without their patronage, many of the small businesses would have trouble staying afloat. Although Polly had no intention of sharing her secret any time soon, after the conversation with Alice about keeping the recipe safe, she had made arrangements for what would happen to the pie crust recipe when her time on earth had come to an end. Unfortunately, that time came much sooner than anyone expected, and as a result, things were about to change in Ipswich, especially for Alice Anderson. Mr. Ogden's office was only three blocks away from Anders the Andersons' house, so Alice decided to ride her bike. As she pedaled off down the street, she felt a song coming on. I'd rather be... I'd rather you were here, of course. I miss you through and through, but thank you for the recipe, and Polly, I love you. Singing about the recipe made Alice's stomach rumble. She had been so busy missing Aunt pa Polly, she hadn't realized she'd been missing something else, too. Her pies. July was berry season. How good a slice of triple berry pie would taste right now, she thought. Aunt Polly used only the ripest berries, sweetening them with clover honey and a splash of vanilla. The thought of that pie with its crispy golden crust and a scoop of homemade ice cream to go with it made Alice feel so giddy she missed the turn on Maple Street and had to circle and go back. Mr. Ogden was sitting at his desk when Alice arrived. He was wearing a blue and white seersucker suit, a crisp white shirt, and a red tie. His pants were held up with a pair of suspenders the same shade of red as his tie, and Alice noticed he wore a black pair of wing a pair of black wingtip shoes very much like the ones both Mayor Needleman and Reverend Flowers had worn to her Aunt Polly's funeral. Alice knew they were called wingtips because her father also owned a pair, though he hadn't worn his to the funeral because he said they pinched his bunions. On the desk in front of Mr. Ogden lay a large white envelope, and on the other side of the desk sat two chairs, one of which was occupied by a brown leather case about the size of a bread box, decorated with leopard print trim. Alice knew right away what was inside. Hello, Lardo, she whispered through the little mesh window sewn into one end of the case. Lardo was Polly Portman's grumpy old cat, and Alice was scared to death of him. Talk about nasty. Lardo would scratch and bite and hiss at anybody who came near him, except for Polly. He'd showed up filthy and half-starved at the pie shop one day, and when no one came to claim him, Polly took pity on him and decided to let him stay. Thanks to a steady diet of fried sardines and sweet cream, he quickly tripled in size. His big, fat belly hung so low it brushed the floor as he walked. But that wasn't the reason Polly had decided to call him Lardo. She had assumed at first that he was a tabby cat, but after risking life and limb to bathe him and brush him, brush out his matted gray coat, she discovered that underneath all that dirt soot, he was actually white. So Polly decided to name him after the whitest thing she could think of, vegetable shortening. There was a big pantry in the back of the pie shop where Polly kept a supply of essential ingredients for her baking. Anyone who's ever made a pie knows that you can't make a pie crust without using some form of fat. Some people like butter, others prefer oil, but Polly Portman was a firm believer in vegetable shortening. She went through globs of glistening snow-white goop every week at the shop, and the brand she always used was called Lardo. Most people wouldn't have tolerate, let alone loved, a cat with a rotten disposition like Lardo's, but Polly adored and doted on him. Every morning, before she went downstairs to the shop, she would fry up three sardines and put them on a little blue china plate for Lardo. He wouldn't give her the satisfaction of seeing him eat the fish, of course, but one of Polly's favorite things in the world was to come upstairs at the end of the long day of baking and to find a little blue, the little blue plate lit clean. You must be hungry. Alice said, peering into the, ca ca the carrying case at Lardo. His, he narrowed his yellow eyes at her and hissed. Charming cat, sniffed Mr. O Ogden. Alice felt a guilty pain. 
Everybody had been so wrapped up in Polly's passing and in planning for the funeral, they'd all completely forgotten about Lardo. He'd been cooped up in the empty pie shop for three days with nothing to eat. No wonder he was grumpy. Poor kitty, said Alice. <sighs> Another hiss, even louder than the last, emanated from the case. Getting here when him here was no easy feat, Mr. Ogden said. Took me over an hour to pull him out from under the bed. As you can see, I did not escape unscathed. He held up his hands, displaying an impressive array of band-aids. Don't take it personally, Aunt Alice told him. Lardo doesn't like anybody. Mr. Ogden looked at his watch and frowned. Uh, have a seat, young lady, he told Alice, indicating the unoccupied chair across from him. Alice did as he instructed sitting on the very edge of the chair, in case Lardo tried to take a swipe at her through his carrying case. Uh, as I mentioned on the phone, Mr. Ogden began, this matter concerns a certain bequest, a, a gift, which your aunt has made on your behalf. I know, Alice said, feeling a little flutter of excitement under her ribs as she imagined the celebration of the Anderson family would have at their house that evening. Mr. Ogden paused, pressing his fingertips together. Uh, before we proceed, I'd like to explain a few things about your aunt's will, he said. I knew Polly for over 50 years. She was both a client and a friend. Uh, I will miss her, not to mention that remarkable Concord grape pie she used to make. Mr. Ogden lifted, licked his lips, savoring the memory of the pie. For a moment, bef for a moment before continuing... Uh, when Polly asked me to supervise the execution of her will, which is to say sign it at, in my office with the necessary witnesses, I was more than happy to do so. However, I feel that it's important that you know that the actual will itself was not prepared by me. It was written at home by your aunt in her own handwriting. After signing it before two witnesses, my secretary, Miss Lebson, and a gentleman by the name of Hammerschalt, she sealed it in an envelope, which she instructed me to open only in the event of her death. I read it myself for the first time this morning. What did it say? Alice asked, hoping Mr. Ogden's answer would be a lot shorter than the long-winded speech he'd just delivered. We'll get to that in a minute, he said. First, I'd like to remind you that as your aunt's attorney, my role in this matter is to merely inform you of her intentions, not to explain the reason for them and to see that they are carried out in the manner in which she has requested. Do you understand? I think so, Alice said, afraid that if she admitted she hadn't understood something, he'd feel the need to repeat the whole thing all over again. Very well, Mr. Ogden said. Then he cleared his throat and began to read the will aloud. The document consisted of a single page, handwritten in blue ink. It took Mr. Ogden less than a minute to read it, and when he finished, two things were perfectly clear. Polly Portman had left her secret pie crust recipe to her beloved cat, Lardo, and she had left her beloved cat, Lardo, to Alice. A story, a story, let it come, let it go. That's the end of chapter three. Um, I look forward to reading chapter four to you tomorrow. All right, goodbye, Riverside.